Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this special guest lecture hosted by Centre for Wellbeing Science and the Faculty of Education, formerly known as the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, here at the University of Melbourne. It's lovely to see so many of you with us this evening. My name is Lindsay Odes, and I'm the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Education uh, and a Professor of Wellbeing Science. And I would also like to acknowledge our, our Dean, uh, Professor Jim Waterston, who is with us, uh, and our Deputy Dean, Professor Larissa McLean Davies, or Professoressa Larissa McLean Davies, always <laughs> have trouble saying that. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional uh, custodians of the unceded land on which we work, learn and live, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Uh, I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging and extend the respect to other uh, Indigenous Australians present. I also acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the Academy uh, and that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years and these lands being the place of age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, uh, and that the local Aboriginal peoples have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of these lands. As a community of researchers and educators, professional staff and students, we are privileged to work and learn every day with Indigenous colleagues and partners. Uh, and particularly this year, uh, in the case of the referendum, these issues are very omnipresent for us and I get you to reflect upon that. So I am truly delighted to welcome Professor Richard Ryan, uh, our guest speaker, uh, the most cited psychologist in the world today at the moment uh, and co-founder of self-determination theory. Given Professor Ryan is somewhat of a celebrity uh, in the world of psychology, uh, many of you will be aware of his credentials. However, it is worthwhile uh, to remind you of the notable stages of his career to date. So Richard Ryan is a professor at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education at Australian Catholic University in Sydney. He is also a distinguished professor in the College of Education at Iwa Women's University at the Republic of Korea and visiting professor at the Dyson School of Engineering at Imperial College London. As a clinical psychologist and co-developer of self-determination theory, commonly known as SDT, a leading theory of human motivation and the basis of practice in schools and education, work, organisations, clinics, healthcare, sport and technology, genuinely on an international scale. Uh, Ryan's work focuses on factors which promote high quality motivation. So not just the amount, of not the amount of motivation, but particularly the quality of motivation and engagement and healthy development and psychological wellness. As mentioned, Professor Ryan is among the most cited and influential researchers in psychology and social sciences today and has authored over 450 papers and books, including self-determination theory, basic psychological needs in motivation, development and wellness uh, with his well-known colleague, uh, DC or Desi. So reflective of Professor Ryan's influence internationally, he's been recognised as one of the eminent uh, psychologists of the modern era, uh, listed among the top 20 most influential industrial organisational psychologists and received four lifetime awards. A couple of other things, and I'm going to give you a couple of uh, personal reflections. Uh, Professor Ryan here has lectured in more than 100 universities worldwide and has received multiple career awards from multiple societies for his contributions to the field of motivation, personal meaning, uh, self and identity, and is also a fellow of the American Psychological uh, Association. A couple of uh, personal points. Um, I've had the pleasure, my last time I had the pleasure of introducing Professor Ryan was in the, uh, our third, positive, third Australian Positive Psychology Conference in 2012, 
uh, and I see Professor, Associate Professor Gavin Slemp in the, in the uh, front row, who was given the Emerging, uh, Emerging Researcher Award at that conference. So that's how long ago 2012 <laughs> was. Um, another uh, important point uh, for me personally, uh, I have the pleasure of working with uh, Professor Richard Ryan on a, a, a consensus paper of wellbeing education uh, headed by Professor Ryan's colleague uh, um, at the University of Rochester. Um, and that, that, that's about to be submitted to the Harvard Educational Review. And so we're looking at what wellbeing education is, through, particularly through the lens of self-determination theory. More, more personally, uh, my wife is present, um, and we have used autonomy supportive parenting with both of our sons. So that, it doesn't um, um, get much more personal than that. So that's enough from me. I'm sure you will agree that we are extremely fortunate to have Professor Ryan presenting to us tonight. Uh, so you please now join me in giving him a very warm welcome to deliver his lecture, Motivation and Wellness in School Research from Self-Determination Theory. Welcome. First, I want to thank Lindsay for using this picture, which is at least 15 years old. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here tonight, particularly Gavin Schlemp, who, uh, who uh, I said before, seduced me into coming here this evening <laughs> by telling me I was just going to give a small informal talk. And then <laughs> here we are. Um, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I really uh, enjoyed the, uh, the meetings we had today with graduate students and the conversations that we had. So it's really nice to be in this atmosphere and nice to see so many of you interested in the topic of motivation and wellness in education. And so thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, before I get to anything, I want to acknowledge that any of the work I talk about tonight that uh, might be attributed to me is not really mine. It's a function of a community of researchers around the world who do self-determination theory. And I list here just a few of the recent collaborators I've had who've really uh, made, uh, made excellent work and uh, made my life a lot easier by working with me on these things. And many of them are, uh, as you can see, Australian researchers, because I've been here since, well, I came here first for that conference at uh, Wollongong and then couldn't leave. Uh, and so uh, since then, ACU has been my primary banner. And it's been really great to have so many colleagues in the country. Uh, my particular research group is a very small group. Uh, the four people on top are the Australian contingent of that. Uh, Emma Bradshaw, Jasper Duenfeld, Kelly Farber, and Ben uh, Seward, who are really uh, kind of the key uh, people backing up all of the research that we do. And then there's a, a Canadian contingent, uh, which is uh, uh, Stefano D. Domenico, my son, William Ryan, who teaches at the University of Toronto. Uh, I don't know why he wants to collaborate with me. I think it was that autonomy support, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Georges May, who's at the University of Montreal. So that's the, our current group uh, of active researchers. Um, so uh, you know what I want to talk to you tonight about is about self-determination theory. And it's a pretty broad theory. It's been around for a long time. I really started my work with Ed DC in the uh, 1970s. Uh, Ed began the work with his work on intrinsic motivation. And I joined with him in that work uh, pretty early on. And uh, you know we. Uh, we really started with a phenomena that's at the top here, which is intrinsic motivation. We were really interested in uh, the kind of motivation that's driven by just your interest and engagement in an activity, because you find the activity itself interesting, challenging, and fun to do. And we were interested in intrinsic motivation, particularly in classrooms, uh, and how that could be cultivated. And uh, as we uh, studied motivation, we also saw both in education and in workplaces and in uh, many other walks of life that intrinsic motivation, while important, is not the only important kind of motivation. So is extrinsic motivation, and particularly uh, you know, doing something that's not fun because you understand the strong value behind it. So we wanted to develop a theory of high quality extrinsic motivation. And so we moved to that. And as you'll see tonight, when we explored the conditions that support both intrinsic motivation and high quality extrinsic motivation, those very social conditions that are supportive are also the conditions that are essential to people's wellness. And uh, so we developed a theory of well-being out of that. Um, the theory has built, as we call it, brick by brick. We try and uh, build a certain part of the theory and then expand that part of the theory to new domains. And uh, this slide doesn't show up very well, but one of the places that we went to from there is people's life goals. 
how some kind of life goals deeply satisfy basic psychological needs and other life goals, even when you're successful at them, may not satisfy those needs and then lead to not wellness. And so we look at intrinsic and extrinsic goals as a, as a determinant of well-being. And when you start to claim that there are some universal principles of well-being, then that leads to a lot of cross-cultural work and understanding the nuances through which uh, uh, motivation is expressed and needs are satisfied. So a lot of our work has been cross-cultural. And uh, so it's led us to many topics. We do uh, work at every level of analysis from the neuropsychology of autonomy all the way up to the uh, political and social conditions that support or oppress autonomy, competence, and relatedness in life. So <clears throat> just to make a long story short, you know, we study a lot of different areas. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I started my own uh, uh, journey into psychology. Uh, as a clinician, I was a director of clinical training for a long time, a trainer of psychotherapists. But, um, you know, as we were discussing today, we also wanted to promote wellness at scale, and that's why we do uh, big theory as we do, and apply it in many different domains. So beyond that original domain of psychotherapy and behavior change, education, organization, sport, uh, physical activity, technology, many other areas of applied work uh, uh, that we've extended it. But across all these different areas of work, I would say that there's really one fundamental question that we've always been asking. It's the same question across all domains. What is it that allows people to flourish? And also, what gets in the way of that flourishing? What are the social conditions under which people don't flourish or get uh, uh, saltified in some way? And uh, I, I think a basic assumption of our work is that everybody's born to flourish. It's in our nature to flourish. It's the very nature of the uh, synthetic function of the self to integrate, to differentiate, to grow. But we, knowing that that's our nature doesn't mean that it's automatic. Uh, it may be automatic for an acorn to grow into a tree, but it won't do so without proper nutriment, without sunlight, without water. And in the same way, we won't psychologically grow without the proper nutriments and supports from our social environments around us. And uh, so, you know, we say growth needs both physical and psychological nutriments. And when we think about those psychological nutriments, we use a, a term that is sometimes controversial, but we call, we use the term of need. The term need is not really controversial when it comes to physical things. I think we all can agree that there are some physical needs for all of us. There are some vitamins that we have to have. There are some nutrients we have to have. And if we don't get them, we deteriorate or we fail to thrive. Uh, similarly, though, we can identify that there are certain social conditions and supports under which people will likely flourish, and there are some under which they will uh, show, well, well, conditions of deprivation of those basic psychological needs that will uh, lead them to not grow and become defensive, compartmentalized, uh, sometimes uh, antisocial, other kinds of outcomes that are associated with need deprivation in development and, and context. And so well, when we use the term basic psychological need, we don't mean it as a preference or as a, uh, uh, something that you want strongly. We mean it as something that's essential to your health and your wellness. So sometimes I'll talk about some needs tonight. People won't particularly value those needs. They won't have preferences for them. Some cultures might oppress or uh, say that these are not important needs. But our argument is if you don't get these needs fulfilled, you will not thrive. So it's not about your conscious preferences. It's about what is the human psyche need in order for it itself to grow. And uh, so we think these needs are natural. They're built into the design of, uh, of our human nature. And, uh, that there's good evolutionary reasons to believe uh, these needs are essential to us. And we, therefore, we also think they're universal. And they're cross-developmental. So they're also cross-cultural. And, uh, and so we do a lot of work to try and establish that fact. But given that we have some, such a strong definition of what a basic psychological need is, uh, there's not very many of them. Because most uh, psychological nutrients won't fit that strong definition. So essentially, we come down to three that we have settled on. We're never settled. There's always arguments in our labs for the fourth and the fifth and the sixth need and what they should be. But these three have been uh, robust enough uh, to stay in our definition. And we actually are, you know, we can think of these needs as, uh, as things that support positive development. But also, we think about the frustration or deprivation of these needs as things that lead to uh, degradation in human functioning and psychopathology and uh, um, maladaptation. 
So it's really a, what we call a dual process theory where the satisfaction of these basic psychological needs in a given context leads to a more integrative functioning and high quality motivation and uh, sense of wellness and uh, frustration of these needs leads to these negative outcomes. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about the satisfaction and support needs, we're, most of the early work and still current work that we do is about the interpersonal support of these needs, how a teacher can support the basic psychological needs of his or her students, how a, a manager can support the needs of their employees, how uh, a parent can support the basic psychological needs of a child and therefore facilitate their development. But there are other levels uh, that uh, have an impact on basic psychological needs, including organizational influences. And educational institutions, for instance, have policies and normative practices that can either be helpful to need satisfaction or interfere with need satisfaction. And I'm going to talk about some of those this evening. Same true with organizational climates. Um, I do a lot of business consulting, and we look at the climates and how they're facilitating or obstructing need satisfaction in the workplace. And uh, more recently, we've done a lot of work on social contexts, how uh, your uh, cultural or economic environment that you're in might have a positive influence or a negative influence on needs. So we, uh, we started this work a long time ago in Bulgaria, looking at how Bulgaria in the late 1980s, uh, where we started studying it, had both positive and negative effects on the, on the people who were there, comparing it with American culture, which also had positive and negative effects of the people there. So. Um, Maybe controversial, but we think all cultures, all organizations have pluses and minuses about these things that are worthy of being studied. So in that sense, uh, it's an open theory to both be critical and reflective on what our practices in general are. So let me just talk about these basic needs for a minute. The uh, first is the need for water. Um, <laughs> And uh, besides the need for water, one of the basic psychological needs is the need for competence. And this is particularly important in schools, but it's really important anywhere. If you're working or studying or existing in a place, you want to feel like you're effective at the things that you're doing. You want to feel like uh, when you go to work or when you go to your classroom that uh, you're going to have tasks that you can mostly accomplish, that you can mostly feel good about doing, that you can feel some efficacy in. The ongoing frustration of a basic psychological need for competence leads people to withdraw, to disengage, and also to internalize a bad concept and feeling about themselves. And so uh, establishing the grounds for people to feel a sense of competence, no matter where their starting point is or what their uh, um, background is, is really essential to motivation. And when we think about competence, it's not just self-efficacy for a task. Um, that, that's an aspect of competence, but it's really a sense that uh, I can do what is important to do here, I have supports to do what I, is important to do here, and that I'm also growing and progressing in what I'm doing. So it's that sense that there are pathways that I'm on, and I'm moving along those pathways. That's, that's really what the sense of competence is, not just that I can do what I was told to do. And, uh, you know, that sense of competence, I'll go into some of the supports for it tonight, but really depends upon the fact that from our activity we're getting positive feedback because we can see its effect, and also we get positive feedback interpersonally from the people around us that supports that sense of efficacy in what we're doing. The next of uh, the basic psychological needs is the need for relatedness, and uh, this may be the least controversial of these, but uh, relatedness is something that we um, are, are kind of born to want to experience. We want to attach to other people. We want to feel respected and significant in the social environments that we're in. A student in a classroom wants to feel like they matter to the teacher, that they're significant to the teacher, that they belong in the classroom, that they're welcomed into the classroom. These are things that are just essential to wanting to be engaged there. And we could say the same thing about workplaces or sport teams or uh, any other endeavor that we're engaged in. And uh, when we look at relatedness, we, we see it results from the experience of being cared for, that people do treat you like you matter and that uh, your experience matters and that you're respected in that way, but it's also uh, obtained from being able to care for others. And the sense of caring for others, giving to others, helps us not only feel like we matter and are connected to other people, but it's just deeply satisfying. So we see a great convergence between caring for others and the satisfaction of both autonomy and relatedness needs. And then the final need, and probably the one that's unique to self-determination theory, is this basic psychological need, which is the need for autonomy. 
And for us, autonomy is the sense that uh, what you're doing is self-regulated and volitional. You're willing to do the things that you're doing, and you stand behind it. You endorse what you're doing, either because you're interested in it or because you have a sense of value and appreciation for what it's worth. So when you're pursuing things that have that sense, you're engaged in autonomy. And uh, sometimes we use the word authenticity for it because it, when you're being autonomous, you're doing something that is expressing yourself and your values, and you feel that deeply. And uh, it's just important to individual wellness, as I'll show in, in uh, some data coming up. But because this is so central to our theory, I do want to make some distinctions between autonomy and some sometimes closely related concepts. And the first one is independence, because we do not see autonomy as the same thing as independence. In our work, independence is not relying on other people for guidance or support. And so when you're independent, you're not taking anybody else's advice. You're doing something on your own. And uh, that might be a good thing. But you can be autonomously independent when you say, well, I'd like to do this on my own. I want to try to do this without the support of others. That would be autonomous independence. But you could also be autonomously dependent when you, when you willingly turn to other people to, for support. When you uh, volitionally get guidance and follow that guidance, that's autonomous dependence. And we actually find that the healthiest adolescents are not the most independent adolescents, but the uh, adolescents who experience autonomy and they have autonomous dependence sometimes on their parents because they're willing to go to their parents for guidance and support. Uh, adolescents that we find are mostly independent of their parents are people who've been moving away from their parents, typically because the parents have been too controlling or not need satisfying in some way. So we, we see uh, dependence as a positive thing when it's autonomously done. Another thing that uh, autonomy is not is it's not separateness. It's not uh, individualism. It's not being away from other people. In fact, probably the most autonomous thing we do is express love and care for other people. I mean, what's more autonomous than the love and the expressions of love that we have for our family members or for our close friends? These are things we do willingly even when they're not fun or intrinsically motivated because love is essentially something we, uh, at our core, volitionally do. It's also not freedom. And sometimes people use the term freedom interchangeably with autonomy. But in our theory, freedom is uh, the release of a person from constraints, the absence of constraints. But you can be released from all constraints and still not have autonomy if you don't have a willing purpose, if you don't know where you're going. You could just be lost. People remove all constraints, but you don't have a, a thing that, an aim that you're standing behind. So you need something more in order to have autonomy than just release from constraints. In fact, most of the time, if you just release people from constraints, like in a classroom or a business organization, you get chaos. What you need is goals and structure to help uh, um, bring autonomy to bear on the things that matter and are important. So these are really critical in all the domains we're studying, but particularly in education, as we'll get to. And so I just wanted to spend a little time on that before we get into um, specifics. Now, autonomy is something we all personally experience to different degrees in the activities we're engaged in. And when we think about autonomy in, uh, in self-determination theory, we think about it in terms of a continuum of motivations that we have for doing what we're doing. Um, and I'm just going to use the example here of, uh, say, uh, a, a student doing homework. So a student could be amotivated for doing homework. And one reason might be that they're, one reason they're amotivated, they're not, they're not doing it, is because they see no value or interest in it. But they also might be amotivated because they don't feel like they can do it. They can't succeed at it, so why bother? These are both sources of amotivation. And of course, this is a pretty uh, often maladaptive outcome in many uh, contexts. Uh, more widely seen is a student might do homework because of external motivation, or we call it external regulation, which is you're doing it because there'll be sanctions or punishments for not doing it, or there'll be rewards for doing it. So some external contingency is what's driving your behavior. This can be a really powerful form of motivation. In fact, when I started the, in the field of motivation, this was the main motivation that everybody studied. It was behaviorist theory and reinforcement theory. It's a very powerful form of motivation, but I think something that both behaviorists and self-determination theory would agree on is if you, try and, if you start to motivate people through external motivation, they become reliant on the external motivation. And as soon as you're not there with either the carrot or the stick to motivate them, the motivation itself disappears. So it's not generalizable, it's not internalized, and it doesn't last. 
And typically, if you're motivating people through rewards, you've got to keep upping the rewards because there's a satiation effect that happens. And so it's not a sustainable way to keep people motivated in a particular context. But still, external motivation is at least some degree of agency in the sense that the person is now purposively doing something. So if we move up on the continuum of autonomy a little more, we get to what I think is the most nuanced and interesting state of motivation, which we call interjection. And interjection is when I'm doing something, doing my homework because my parents might approve of it or the teacher's going to approve of it or I don't want to uh, get this, I don't want to have their disappointment in my not doing it. So it's driven by self-esteem contingencies because of the approval of self or others. And uh, it's, a, again, a very powerful form of motivation. I think most of us who've been through anything in academia have seen a lot of interjection in our lives uh, of, of people uh, really having their self-esteem hinged on how well they engage in an activity. So it's, again, very powerful, but the problem with this form of motivation is, number one, it's hard to sustain, and it's particularly hard to stay, sustain in the face of challenges as you start to experience failures or blocks or hazards in your motivation. It's really easy to uh, have injury to your own self-esteem and to suffer psychologically. So what we see with interjection is even when it motivates people, it has psychological costs associated with it. And still a little more, uh, autonomous or now very autonomous is what we call identification or integration and now this is when I'm doing something let's say it's homework again I'm doing the homework because I understand it's valuable it may not be fun it may not be interesting but I have an understanding of why this is useful and so doing something because you see value or utility in it is uh, typically a very autonomous thing and as I'll argue tonight most of the time uh, students are often doing something they don't really understand what why why do I have to do this uh, saying, because it's going to be on the test, is not, uh, is not that's external regulation. Uh, a reason for doing it is because you'll see why it has relevance to your life or utility in where you're going, and your aims, etc. And then finally, intrinsic motivation is where we started in our work, which is motivation that's highly autonomous because you're doing something that you find interesting and you're passionate about and because you like doing the activity itself. One of the reasons that we think it's intrinsic motivation is really important is because it's the core of, of human learning. Again, when we look at human nature, we were built to be intrinsically motivated, interested in our environment. I have a three-year-old granddaughter, and I just watch the way she orients around the world. She's interested in everything. It's natural. She wants to learn things. She wants to role play. She wants to understand what we're doing. She's taking in the social regulations around her. So that integrative, interested process is essential to learning, and it continues throughout the lifespan. Most of the things we learn in life, we didn't learn because somebody motivated us from the outside to do it. We learned it because we got interested in something. You know, I read the newspapers every day. Why do I do that? Nobody's going to grade me on it. Nobody's going to give me a test. Well, maybe they will. My wife, maybe. But, uh, but uh, you know, typically, typically we don't have external incentive, but it's because we care and, and take interest in the world. That's how we really learn. And so this is really going to be really important in the context of education. And by the way, that's my granddaughter on her first day of, day of preschool about three weeks ago. So she did her puzzle right. We gave her a reward. No. <laughs> So as I said, early on, I was, as a clinician, I was doing a lot of child therapy, and I met Ed DC, and we started to talk about you know, human growth and development and autonomy and issues like that, and he invited me to get involved in some school studies that he was doing. And at the time, we were surveying teachers about their techniques of, or strategies of motivating people. And uh, as we um, discovered their orientation, we asked them about their orientation, and, how, what, you know, and we did it through a thing we called the Problems in Schools Survey. So uh, they, we gave him a scenario like, you know, Johnny's, or no, Gavin's in your class, and he's been listless and disengaged lately. He hasn't turned in his homework on time. You're not, yeah, 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 okay. So I made a good choice here. Um, and so what would you do about that? And some teachers said, well, you know, I'd make sure Gavin knew what the consequences were for his behavior. There'd be, he'd be kept in from the playground, or, and he'd be given extra work or, until he got his things done. So we call that a controlling approach. And others said, uh, I would, uh, if Gavin's been listless and uninvolved, I need to find out what's going on for Gavin. I need to get inside his frame of reference, understand what's blocking him from engaging in here. And we called that autonomy supportive at the time because it was taking his perspective as the starting point for solving the problem of motivation. And in that first study, we just correlated. Uh, this was, these, uh, these numbers come from five weeks into the school year in this particular set of schools because we couldn't get in to do our work on the first uh, four weeks. 
and already there are really strong relationships between uh, the teacher's orientation toward uh, uh, motivation and what students were reporting in the classroom. Did they want harder or easier work? Well, if they were in an autonomy supportive classroom, they were more willing to take on challenges, but if they were in a controlling classroom, they wanted easy stuff that they could master well. They were more curious in autonomy supportive classrooms and more independent mastery attempts trying on their own. But as a young clinical psychologist at the time, because again, this was, I think this was before many of you were born, not all of you, <laughs> uh, but 1979 when we were doing this study, it was published in 81. Uh, the thing that really struck me was this one, that global self-worth was affected as strongly as that. So the next year, we went into other schools. We did a longitudinal study. Look, I got it in the first day of school. And we saw this effect, this spreading effect of students' self-worth and uh, perceived competence going down and uh, in controlling classrooms and going up in autonomy supportive classrooms. So pretty significant effects in short order. And it convinced me that, um, you know, at scale, if you want to affect mental health, one of the ways you could do it is go through uh, education systems. So that's actually where we started our work. This was our first study to get. And, you know, even still today, we see that intrinsic motivation plays a big part in motivating student engagement and in outcomes, and it does so in uh, really diverse populations. It, it's an important factor in schools. Not the only one, but it's an important one. So I guess a sad fact about that is in most countries where we study uh, the developmental trajectory of intrinsic motivation. Here you see this very exacting statistical graph up here. <clears throat> but it goes down like this, uh, starting really uh, in kindergarten. Kids come in with a high level of intrinsic motivation, curiosity, and interest in what's going on. And over the years of school, it goes down with a couple of big blips that we can identify, usually third to fourth grade. There's a big blip in most countries. And I, I, I'm not going to go into the details of it here, but glad to answer later why that is. Any place where there are middle schools, it tends to go down with middle schools because middle schools tend to be really controlling in their atmosphere. They, people don't trust adolescents and they try to um, bring a lot of controls to them and we see a big dip there. It usually levels out somewhere um, low around 10th or 11th grade. In some countries it goes back up again and Canada goes back up again because in the last two years of school you get a lot of choice over what you're doing and you start to move toward the things of interest, but in most countries that's not the case. Um, anyway, just to get off intrinsic motivation for a minute, when you look at this continuum of motivational states, it's a continuum of relative autonomy. You're getting more and more autonomous as you go up uh, this scale and benefits accrue as you move up. But most of us, when we're doing something, and if I'm a, a student in school, I have several of these motives operating at once. And so there's kind of a, we, we typically do kind of a total score. So you have some degree of interest in what's going on. You have some degree of value. You have some degree of interjection. There are some pressures on you. And depending on which ones are the most salient, that's going to be the predictive uh, outcome in, in our measurement strategies. And just to show that there is a continuum here, there's been many ways of modeling it, but I just pick out this one from a a meta-analysis that, that was done by Josh Howard at Monash University where they were looking at uh, uh, all the studies where, we've, where this uh, continuum has been applied and then they applied multi-dimensional scaling to it and they made a one-dimensional multi-dimensional scaling outcome and you can just see that these things fall along a very uh, clear continuum in, in student populations, in employee populations, and in general populations the, the pattern of, of, uh, the, the, of the continuum holds up. There are many ways of showing the simplex patterns and other ways, but this, I thought this was an elegant way of showing it. Now, this is kind of a side point, but I'm pretty much a statistical nerd, and this is one of the studies that we've been involved in recently, so I have to show it. This is uh, really led by Stefano Di Domenico, who's at the University of Toronto. And uh, in this study, what we did is we took every measure of motivation we could find in the field of education. So we took every scale, every measure that we could find, and we ended up with 1,400 items that we derive from all those scales. And we subjected those to what's called a bass ackwards analysis, which is, um, I guess we'll call it a hierarchical principal components analysis. So you start, you do a principal component analysis, you get your first large factor, then you force two factors, you force three factors, you force four factors, until the model breaks down into nothing. So in our first bass ackwards on those 14 items, we came out on those 1,400 items. Well, first we shrunk the by getting rid of redundancies and bad items and things. But that came down to seven super factors. And then we did bass ackwards analysis on every one of those super factors. And we ended up with 28 different uh, 
constructs that represented different kinds of motivation in uh, education. So we were, and, these, and this is all directed towards college education. Why did you study in college? Or uh, what are your motivations for doing university work? This is only to say this is how they mapped out in an MDS. And then in this MDS, we located, we put our own scales in the middle of it just to see where they would fall. And what you can see is the continuum of motivation falls out across all these items. And then when you look at the specific other constructs, they all possess some degree of relative motivation. So you know, if you're uh, seeking fame or trying to look smart, you can see it falls somewhere down here in the interjected range. If you're avoiding, if you don't care about others' evaluation or you want competition, it's down here in the interjected range, but more toward the negative interjection range. Uh, when you're avoiding work or you're aimless, you can see it's down here on the control again. So it's just to say that w whatever motivation we're looking at, there's some degree of autonomy that matters to it. We don't really know what the other dimension is in this MDS. We argue about it, but clearly there's a relative autonomy dimension within it. So SDT thinks, well, the further you get up on this continuum, the more you're operating in the autonomous end, the more positive the outcomes. And so what I want to do is show you some evidence for that in the domain of school. And this, again, comes from Josh Howard. And uh, he did a meta-analysis on uh, all the studies of SDT in education where the continuum of motivation had been measured. And uh, luckily, I got to cooperate uh, with their team on doing this. And you can see 344 samples. Um, over 200,000 students are involved in this meta-analysis. It's a pretty massive meta-analysis. And we looked at 26 different outcomes, performance, well-being, goal orientation, and persistence outcomes. So it's a big study. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the details of it. But one way of kind of summarizing what we saw in that is uh, we took some of the outcomes and we grouped them as what we called adaptive outcomes. Higher academic performance, more engagement, more sense of efficacy, more mastery orientation, more vitality and energy uh, in school, and more positive affect on the adaptive side and on the maladaptive more absenteeism, dropout intention, anxiety, depression, and boredom. And uh, what you can see here is a motivated um, students are highly maladaptive uh, outcomes and uh, low on adaptive outcomes. As you move to external, you see that uh, still uh, kind of a balance, so away from uh, adaptive toward more maladaptive. Interjected, you can see that's just really where the crossover point comes in terms of the cross and benefits of internalized motivation. And then as you get up into the autonomous end, you can see a more adaptive motivation and less maladaptive motivation as the outcomes of that. Now, some people are really fascinated in fetishizing a performance in schools, and this is the thing on student grades that's here. And you can see that uh, more autonomous motivation is associated with better grades. But that's not our focus in SDT. I'm, I'm pretty suspicious about grades and grading, as I'll get into later. But you know, it is an outcome people care about. But this is the one I care about, which is the well-being of students. And you can see again here that when students are engaged in a more autonomous manner, they have higher well-being. They have more vitality, more positive affect, more satisfaction, more enjoyment in what they're doing. And when they're less autonomously motivated, you can see that there's more anxiety, more depression and more negative affect. So this is true in all domains, not just true in the academic domain. This is a recent meta-analysis that uh, I got to do with uh, Diego Vasconcelos and uh, colleagues at uh, IPPE in, in Sydney. And here we're looking at phys ed teachers. And the same pattern comes out in terms of motivation with phys ed, which is uh, here's 265 samples, about 18,000 students involved in this meta-analysis. Uh, and uh, you can see autonomous motivation being associated with adaptive outcomes in the PE sphere and uh, more controlling forms of motivation associated with maladaptive outcomes. And you can see that teacher support is really essential as a background to having that autonomy and that autonomous motivation that's supporting those more adaptive outcomes. And I'm going to get into what teacher support looks like in just a couple minutes. And in music schools, and this is not my study, this is done by uh, Paul Evans and colleagues, at, uh, he's at uh, UNSW. And this is just one of his studies where he's looking at basic psychological needs in relation to autonomous motivation. And they're looking at practice in university music students, conservatory students in New Zealand and in um, Australia. Uh, Gary McPherson here in uh, Melbourne was very instrumental in this, in this work. Um, and you can see that the practice frequency of musicians is, more, is uh, higher with more autonomous motivation. But even more important, they rate the quality of their own practice as higher if they're more autonomously motivated. And they tend to choose more challenging pieces to practice, just as an interesting outcome of that. So across 
all different kinds, forms of education across all levels of edu education, from uh, preschool all the way up through uh, university. We see a pattern in which more autonomous motivations associated with more sustained engagement, with better performance, with better well-being, and I haven't gotten into it yet, but with more pro social, at social attitudes and, and community in schools itself. So we think, well, how do, you, how do you get people up that continuum? How do you move people from more controlled places to more autonomous places, or oppositely, how do environments or contexts bring people away from those more positive forms of motivation into less adaptive ones? And so we think the key to that is basic psychological needs support. When you support autonomy, competence, and relatedness needs, you're going to have more autonomous motivation. When you frustrate those needs, you get more heteronymous motivation. So I just wanted to spend a minute saying, well, what does that look like in a, in a practical atmosphere? And these are very general principles. We could get more nuanced as we move into a specific context. But the first thing is that competence is supported by having activities that are designed so that mastery is the dominant experience. You know, I'm somebody who consults with video game companies. And you know, a good video game is one where you're mostly master, you mostly feel mastery. It's mastery, 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 boss fight. Mastery, 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 boss fight. That's how a good video game is designed. So it means you're mostly feeling like you can do what's being asked of you. And once in a while, you get a difficult challenge. And I say that's what we want at work, too. Can you imagine going in every day and being optimally challenged at work, being on the edge of your skills at work every day? It would be horrible. Mostly, we want to feel like we can do what we're doing, and we, can, and we have mastery over our domain. So it's important to design our atmospheres so that that's the case. Also, um, competence is supported by what we call structure or scaffolding. So structure is where you're providing people with the guidelines and the tools and the principles so that they can see, succeed at the activities that they're doing. And if they aren't succeeding, you're not just evaluating that or criticizing for that. You're giving them the tool they need to make that next step. That's what scaffolding is. So if you were trying to teach somebody to climb, you, know, you wouldn't remove all the ropes and all the ladders. You would help them. Uh, find a, a, a pitch and a climb that's optimal for them until they mastered that and then they could move on. So scaffolding is really important. And feedback is important in building competence, but not you did well or you did badly, but rather here's the way in which you did well, here was the things that were successful, and here's the things you could do to be more successful. So we call it informational feedback. It's particularly efficacy relevant. It's not telling you where you stand next to other people. It's telling you how you can do this activity. And uh, you know, praise, we think of praise as feedback, but praise is a mixed bag. So praise is great when praise is really about something that you've accomplished, when it's really specific to what you've done or a thing that you've effort you've put in. And it really can backfire when it's like, oh, you're, a, you're an excellent student, or you're so smart, or those things are not helpful praise. They actually undermine motivation because they set you up for failure or for social comparison. They get your ego involved. They promote interjection. So praise is a nuanced thing in self-determination theory. Mostly good, but sometimes undermining. And finally, you know, what helps build competence is that you can see that there are areas for growth that are conveyed. People are showing you the pathways that you can go on where you're going to be able to feel successful. And that's really important in education particularly. Relatedness support, often discussed, but, the, but how, how is it conveyed in a classroom? Well, part of it is just that every individual in that classroom is respected, and that respect is conveyed. It's that people matter. You know, as an as a instructor, I want to make sure that everybody feels welcomed in my classroom, that I smile at the people who come into the room, so they, they know I care, that it matters to me that they're there. And conveying that is really, really important in their sense of connection and of mattering in the classroom. And when they don't do well or they're facing challenges, what they get is care rather than criticism or evaluation. Because criticism and evaluation pulls you away from a relationship, makes you disengage, whereas care and concern shows that you matter again. And you know, warmth is good, but there's a particular kind of warmth that I think is important. One of the items that we really like in our surveys is, my teacher likes me. And you notice it's not, I like my teacher. It's, my teacher likes me. Having that feeling that you're liked, that you're cared about, it's really important to feel like you want to be in that classroom. And then finally, uh, as I said before, when you get opportunities to give to others, teach to others, tutor to others, show off to others, those are things that are really cool because you're contributing to the classroom. And that makes you feel more connected to other people and them to you. So it's a good thing to build into an atmosphere.
And then finally, autonomy support. What does that look like? Again, this is an area where we could delve in really deeply, but the general principle, the main principle is when you're going to motivate somebody else to do something, you begin by considering their point of view. You know what it means to be asking them to do this. So by understand, we call it the internal frame of reference. If you take the internal frame of reference of the other person, that's the starting point for all autonomy support. Because you can't understand, you can't support autonomy unless you know what the self that you're supporting is aiming for, wanting, and struggling with. Now, a good thing about that is when you consider that other person's point of view, it typically helps you identify what are the obstacles they're facing. You'll find out what those are. Um, and you'll be able to respond to the needs that are being frustrated for them because you've got a better understanding of what that is. So it's really important, not just because it helps you connect with the person, but it also gives you the strategies for helping them uh, move forward. You're also, when you're supporting autonomy, you're seeking their ideas and, and you're trying to provide them choices where you can provide them choices. And if there are places you can't provide them choices, which is often the case in our standardized and mandated curricula across education, you give them a rationale for why this is an important thing to do. And I say this to all of us in this room, none of us can do something autonomously unless we have a good reason for doing it. This is true for children and adults. Having a good reason for doing something allows us to stand behind it and to endorse it. And that's what autonomy is all about. So a rationale is really, really an important part. And I, you know, I've done uh, classroom ratings across the world, and we see that in some countries, and I'm going to say particularly here in the United States, for instance, we look at mathematics lessons, and they hardly ever tell the students why this might be important or why this might be useful. It's, it's going to be on the test, so we're going to study this thing. And why do we need to lead, learn trigonometry? Well, sometimes there's no rationale for that, and when I think there's no rationale for that, I think, then why the heck are we doing it? We should have a rationale for the things that we're teaching, and one that we can convey to the students to whom we're trying to disseminate information. And that may be a rationale about the importance for future skills, but that should be clear about what that's going to contribute. And uh, when we're trying to support autonomy, of course, we're minimizing controlling language. We're not using rewards in a controlling way. Uh, you can use rewards well in a classroom, but you can also use them really poorly in a classroom. So when you use them to get students to a specified outcome, that's a controlling use of rewards. When you use rewards to acknowledge work well done or effort put in, that can actually support motivation in an autonomous way. So it's about how and why you're administering rewards that uh, provides their, the explanation for their outcomes. And finally, whenever there's struggles, whenever there's obstacles, an autonomy supportive person responds with empathy. Because our students are struggling, the last thing they want to be is criticized in that moment. They want somebody to empathize with it and then help scaffold them out of that issue. So we think autonomy support's just the most essential thing, because if you're doing autonomy support, you're probably also supporting other psychological needs. And in particular, I stole this model from uh, John Marshall Reeve in a chapter he wrote in our recent handbook. But he's saying if you have an attitude of autonomy support, you use that in the provision of structure. And that's what produces perceived competence. And if you're going to be personally involved with students, if you do it in an autonomy supportive way, then you get positive relatedness outcomes from it. But autonomy support underpins all of uh, our in interventions. And so in a, a class, this is an experiment that was done in Belgium, uh, Van Stinkisch and colleagues, they uh, asked teachers to describe their own motivational style, and then they used those self-descriptions uh, to uh, separate classrooms into some that were highly structured but low in autonomy, some that were high in autonomy, high in structure. And then the measure, the outcome measure, was how autonomously motivated are the students in their classrooms. So the students were asked about their own motivation. And you can see that the best, most motivating, autonomously motivating classrooms are the ones that are high in autonomy support, but also high in structure. So you're supporting autonomy, but you're also scaffolding and students, and they know what the goals are, and they have rationales for why they're pursuing them. So I'm going to begin with evidence on why autonomy support works. And uh, I want to begin with parents, because obviously when we look at students in schools, it's not just teachers who are responsible for their motivation. They come to school with certain levels of motivation, sometimes brought about by the home atmosphere in which they're in. And our model of parenting, which uh, really got developed way back in the 1980s with Wendy Grolnick, uh, who was a, a developmental psychologist at Rochester who worked with me, we developed this idea of autonomy, support, structure, and involvement as being the three main uh, ingredients in, in uh, optimal parenting. 
And these are the resources that really support uh, children's growth and autonomy. And I can't help this, I keep sticking pictures of my granddaughter <laughs> and my daughter. That's my daughter, Alex, uh, in Cincinnati. Um, they found out that chickens were hatched across from the preschool and they couldn't help themselves but go over and check them out. Recently, there was a meta-analysis done on uh, the, how parental autonomy support affects outcomes in schools, and this was done by Ariana Vasquez and uh, Erica Patel and colleagues. And uh, this, in this analysis, what you could see is that when parents were more autonomy supportive, it was positively correlated with, more, uh, with higher academic engagement, with more autonomous motivation in school, um, and with greater psychological health and perceived competence. So these were all attitudes that were affected by parental autonomy support. Now we recently ran another meta-analysis under review right now that was, uh, is being led by Emma Bradshaw, who's at uh, IPPE and ACU, and uh, it's a pretty large meta-analysis looking at all the studies we could find on parental autonomy support and children's outcomes, and it's a very hard slide to read, so I'll, I will tell you what's on it here, which is uh, what we look at here is well-being outcomes, and you can see that autonomy supports positively correlated with well-being, but controlling parenting is, is uh, highly correlated with low well-being. So the meta-analysis doesn't only establish the positive benefits of autonomy support, it also shows the uh, negative uh, effects of controlling parenting. And this study involves uh, people from many countries, so this is a, a result that was not moderated by culture, it was not moderated by age, it was not moderated by which parent was the target of the study, it was not moderated particularly by who reported the outcomes. So it's something that holds up across all the studies that have been done all around the world. Um, and uh, just, I think it makes both of those points are pretty important. So just to get to a specific study to illustrate this, this is a study I did a long time ago with Valery Cherkov. Uh, he was a Russian uh, uh, professor who came to the United States and we were just discussing Russian culture and U.S. culture and autonomy support in the two cultures. And he came from Yaroslavl, Russia, and we were in Rochester, New York, so they're both cold, poor northern cities in their respective countries. And uh, so we thought, well, it would be a good comparison. So we compared parents in uh, Yaroslavl and in the US. And he argued that uh, Russian parenting was more controlling and Russian teaching was more controlling. Uh, and there was a main effect for that. But the thing that was most important to us was the relationships between control and autonomy support and outcomes in both countries. And that turned out to be really not that much different. You can see that uh, when parents are autonomy supportive, that was negatively correlated with the students' uh, external regulation for doing their schoolwork. Um, uh, it's uncorrelated with interjection, meaning uh, interjections not reliably tied to uh, those outcomes. And it's positively, uh, uh, both uh, parents and teachers' autonomy support is related to identification, valuing what you're doing in school. And then you see on the bottom line, only teacher autonomy support matters for intrinsic motivation. Parents aren't influencing that. Why? Because teachers are in control of the interest value of what's going on in the classroom and whether the activities are going to be engaging in that way. So both countries show the same pattern. And then when you look at the well-being outcomes of the children in both countries, or both cities, I should say, uh, you see that well-being in both countries is higher uh, when you have more autonomy support of parents and teachers. Uh, mo recent meta-analyses have supported this dual role of parents and teachers. This is a meta-analysis by Julian Bureau and uh, colleagues, 144 studies in this. And I emphasize meta-analyses a lot today because it's just an easier way of summarizing what's out there in the literature. But you can see that uh, both parental autonomy support and teacher autonomy support are associated with greater need satisfaction and therefore associated with more uh, outcomes. Autonomy support is something that happens in a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So in a moment you can feel controlled and your motivation will wane. In a moment you can feel supported and your motivation goes up. And one of the ways of showing that is to do what we look at as daily diary studies of motivation. And this is one, I was at the Max Planck Institute for a while in Germany. So this is German students. Uh, and we designed the study to look at three different subject matters in their schools. One uh, was mathematics, another was their mother language German, and the other was uh, a second language, whatever that second language was. But it was mostly English or Russian. Um, at that time because we were in Berlin. And, uh, and so the typical thing that we look at is the between student level. So most of the uh, analyses that you would see in most studies are the ones that are down here, which is uh, students' uh, general interest in mathematics, their general interest in German, their general uh, interest in language and engagement in those things uh, is associated with the general teacher autonomy support. 
So controlling for that in a, in a uh, multi-level model, when teachers move a little more controlling away from their mean style, interest goes down in the subject matter on that day. So this is true uh, across all three subject matters uh, as we looked across this. And on a day when the teachers are more autonomy supportive than their general mean, interest and engagement in the classroom goes up. So you can see this fluctuation in students' motivation really is a function of the most proximal environment they're in, what's happening today in the classroom. And uh, this was also verified in another study recently by Erica Patel and, and her group. And she showed that, uh, they showed an, that uh, on days when teachers offered more choice, when they uh, asked students in, about their interests and pursued the students' interests, when they gave rationales for why they were doing the work, on those days, students were more engaged and motivated. So daily, it makes a difference. But I wanted to say, you know, it's true in all kinds of classrooms. Uh, the Vasconcellos one uh, looks at PE. We were looking at this in uh, sport teams, and so I got to work on this study with Kimberly Bartholomew and her colleagues in the UK. And in this study, we were looking at uh, athletes in, uh, uh, from club level up to elite level athletes uh, in England. And we were looking at their, their, their reports about their coach's style. And uh, when they reported that their coach's style was more autonomy supportive, they also reported more need satisfaction and had less burnout and higher uh, affect when they were engaged in sport, opposite true for control. So interestingly, before some subset of these athletes went on the field, we were able to take a, a mouth swab so that we could get secretory uh, immunoglobin A, which is a, uh, a secretion that comes out of your mouth when you're uh, under uh, threat, so to speak. So, uh, it's an immunological response, it's a positive response, but it's because you think there's something attacking your system. On days when uh, players were going out into the field to practice and they had a, uh, a controlling coach and they had more uh, reports of need thwarting, they were uh, exhibiting more immunoglobin A. Um, just to move to another domain, this is another study by Paul Evans and, and uh, in this case Elizabeth Fear. And uh, this is uh, done here in Australia. And it's kind of an interesting study to me because what they were looking at is, uh, this is students who are in sixth to seventh grade here. So up until that point, music's been mostly mandatory for students. And at this point, they get to choose, are they going to go on to take electives in music? And so most people say, well, the ones who go on to choose the electives are the talented students or the uh, best performing students. But what this data, and that's true, uh, students who've got higher achievement in music have a, a somewhat of a tendency to choose electives that are music oriented, but a much bigger predictor by far is whether they experience need support in the classroom of their per current music teacher. So if you have a needs, if you perceive your teacher is supporting your needs and you have higher autonomy, competence, and relatedness in the music atmosphere, that's very predictive of whether you'll take music as an elective in the following year. So it shows that it's not just about achievement, it's about the experience you have in the, in the context of education. Now, you know, again, I've said this is cross-cultural. I just wanted to show another example of that. I showed one from Russia, and we've seen a lot of meta-analyses crossing countries. But this was kind of a cool study that I got to do with Young Shim Yang uh, in Korea. And we're, again, we're looking at teachers' autonomy support versus external control. And you can see here in Korea where Young Shim said most people weren't buying the idea that autonomy would be valued in school or important in school. It's predictive of both achievement in the classroom and higher engagement and higher intrinsic motivation. It's not really important, you know, again, as a clinician, as a parent, as a citizen, my concern isn't always with achievement. Achievement's a good outcome, but it's not the most important. The most important one is mental health, is the wellness of our students so that they grow up to be well, healthy, engaged citizens who are curious and, and following things with critical thinking that they're doing. And so how, do, how is that developed? Um, well, we think autonomy support is really important to this, and I just wanted to show one longitudinal study that was done in China by you and colleagues, and sorry for the abbreviations here, but what they were showing is that teacher autonomy support was related to uh, young adolescents' basic psychological needs satisfaction, which in turn leads to school engagement, and more engaged students have less anxiety and depression. And you can see that here in this, because it's a longitudinal study, you can see this is actually bi-directional, because teacher autonomy support supports engagement which is also uh, a buffer. So engaging students in school is something that's good for their mental health. When we create the conditions for engagement, it helps students uh, suffer less anxiety and depression because they have a sense of purpose now and a place in the world to be. We never published this study. It was done probably about 15 years ago. 
uh, but we collected a lot of data from 21 different countries, and it was essay data. We asked students around the world, describe the most motivating teacher that you ever had. Take five minutes and describe that teacher. And then we had another essay, which is describe the least motivating teacher that you ever had. And then we had another essay, which was describe your current teacher. And so we had those randomly assigned, the order of them randomly assigned, and then we analyzed the content of those essays. Now, I'll tell you, the longest essays were the least motivating teacher essays, because people <laughs> like to write about that. Um, I, I don't know why. Uh, but the commonality was just really remarkable across all 21 countries. What we found is that uh, students wrote their, well, uh, that uh, students in every sample, their descriptions of the most motivating teachers was of a teacher who was autonomy supportive, who understood their point of view, who gave them choices where possible, who cared about their interests in the classroom, and teachers who were relatedness, the ones who treated them warmly, who gave them a feeling of belongingness, who gave them respect in the classroom. That was universally the thing that they said about their most motivating teachers, and the opposite was true of unmotivating teachers. And interestingly for us, in no sample did anybody describe their most motivating teacher as the one who used rewards, or the one who was most evaluative or most strict? These were not things that came out in essays. Sometimes those things would be in the not motivating teacher, but they were never in the most motivating teacher, despite the fact that a lot of the rhetoric and uh, teacher education that we have says these things are effective as motivators, not in the minds of the recipients. So we, you know, we've started to do a lot of interventions on this, and I've been doing interventions in schools just um, ad hoc for a long, long time, really, since uh, the, the early 1980s. But uh, John Marshall Reeve, who's now at uh, ACU here in, uh, in um, Sydney, well, up in Sydney, uh, has really systematized the interventions that we've done. And we came out with a book recently that describes the interventions. It's called Supporting Students' Motivation. And the reason we wrote this book is, to, is not to uh, tell it from the top, but to say, you could run this workshop in your own school. So this is a how to run the workshop book. So it's exactly what we would do in a workshop, and it can be done without a leader from self-determination theory, just somebody who's interested in this and goes through the things that are in it. But this intervention uh, that's described in here has been tested, and uh, this is actually an, an old summary of that test uh, coming from uh, 2021, but across the 51 times it had been studied, uh, empirically, uh, in 48 of those 51, it had significant positive effects, and almost all of those effects were robust. They had uh, uh, effect sizes uh, over one. And so I encourage those of you who are interested in what these specific techniques look like is to take a look at this book. But one of the things that was interesting about this is that they also studied uh, schools where this intervention was done and the impact of that on the school culture. So we know that this intervention will bring about more autonomous motivation in students, but uh, uh, what it also seems to do is to lower violence and bullying in schools. And why? Because when you're creating respectful, interpersonally respectful classrooms, that irradiates through the school to have more respect shown from student to student. So you even see in this data that was an American psychologist that there's more bystander intervention in schools where there's more autonomy supportive teaching and there's uh, less peer victimization. So it really has an impact on other outcomes that are associated with human wellness. Now, I just want to do a quick thing here on higher education. There's been, uh, un I, you would think there'd be a lot of studies in higher education, but there's actually fewer than there are in, uh, in secondary education and in elementary schools. I, I don't quite have the answer for that, but this was one that was done uh, by Stupinsky and colleagues. And uh, this was the model that they were testing. They thought that if, if uh, teachers in universities had higher basic psychological need satisfaction, they would have more autonomous motivations for their teaching, and that would show up in higher instructional quality in their classrooms, that there would be more interactive activities, higher order learning would be more uh, present in the classrooms, more reflective, uh, integrative activities would be going on, and uh, possibly more collaborative learning. And this is what they found, which is that need satisfaction I did predict more autonomous motivation, and autonomous motivation in turn predicted more instructional quality, higher order learning, reflective and integrative practices in the classroom. So, so in much of this discussion that I've had, I'm putting all this weight on teachers. But it's not all on teachers. It's also on the institutions within teachers exist and the mandates that teachers are given. And if teachers don't have support for their own autonomy, competence, and relatedness, we can't expect them 
to be conveying those goods to the people who are underneath them. And uh, so there's been a lot of interest in SDT about teacher motivation and what is required for supporting it. And I'm just going to begin with a study that, again, is not mine. It's Haya Kaplan and uh, Nur Majar from, uh, from Israel. And they were looking at pre-service teachers, both Bedouin and Jewish pre-service teachers, because they were really interested in cross-cultural effects in that really difficult set of cultural contexts in Israel. And what they show in here is that pre-service teachers, teachers, when they get uh, support for the relevance of what they're doing and relatedness support and scaffolding and a sense of choice in how they're going about their activities, uh, they feel more need satisfaction. And this results in more uh, a sense of competence relatedness as they engage in their early uh, professional activities um, and uh, less emotional exhaustion. And as we all know, one of the problems with pre-service teaching is a lot of teachers get into the actual classroom and they find out this is not really what I wanted. But one of the reasons it's not what they wanted is they're not seeing the supports that they need in order to be successful and feel efficacious in that context. And this is kind of a preliminary study. It sounds like there's a better one that's going on here. Uh, it, uh, in, in, uh, that I heard today, so I think this is a great area of study. Um, this was just a study that we did in Chinese school in uh, Hubei uh, province. I got to do this with Yu Yan Ni and uh, uh, um, Bei Leng Chua and uh, other colleagues, but uh, we were studying uh, teachers in, uh, in schools in, in Hubei, and so we were really asking about their principal's support of their autonomy. Does your principal support your autonomy? And what you see here is that when they feel autonomy support from their principal, they're more intrinsically motivated, they're more identified, and they're more interjected, which what we find out is they really don't want to disappoint that autonomy supportive principal. So those things are all activated by more autonomy support, and they're less amotivated and less externally regulated. And we see outcomes, intrinsic motivation identified outcome, um, uh, motivations in teachers predict more job satisfaction and less work stress and uh, fewer symptoms of illness. Interjected motivation, interestingly, as I guess we would predict, has, is a plus minus. It's a little bit more with job satisfaction, but it's also associated with ill symptoms because of the stress that it involves. This was done in Australia, however, and this is not my study. Again, it's Rebecca Coley, um, and uh, she was studying Australian teachers. And uh, this is 426 uh, teachers, some are primary and some secondary, some crossing both areas. And you can see what's important to their sense of uh, turnover intentions, uh, relatedness with colleagues and autonomy, supportive leader, leadership being principal pathways through which they experience subjective vitality, uh, energy for their job, and uh, lower turnover intentions. And you can see how autonomy thwarting leadership, controlling leadership, is one of the influences on why teachers turn over in schools, why they want to leave the profession. There was a meta-analysis done by somebody I don't know, <laughs> by Gavin Schlemp. It's one of his many really good meta-analyses. And this was done with uh, teachers. And you can see in the meta-analysis here, and uh, Gavin, could you get up and explain this? <laughs> you can see that uh, when teachers have more need satisfaction, they have more autonomous motivation. And uh, this more autonomous motivation is associated with greater well-being, less teacher distress, and really importantly, more propensity toward autonomy supportive teaching itself. And I don't have a lot of slides on this, but there's been a lot of studies that show when teachers themselves feel support for autonomy, they're more autonomy supportive in their own classrooms. So there's an irradiating or downhill effect of how we treat teachers on how they treat students below them. Uh, just to show that in one simple study, this was on and colleagues in a uh, Chinese sample, and they're looking at autonomous motivation uh, for the teacher, which leads to more need supportive practices. This is in mathematics classrooms. Those more need supportive uh, practices lead students to feel more autonomy and competence, and this leads to more autonomous motivation for studying mathematics, which shows up in the post mathematics score, which controls for the previous score that they had that they get tested the beginning and the end of the semester. So they had improvements in mathematics as a result of that uh, more autonomy supportive teachers. Not just teachers need autonomy support, so do principals. So if you know what's going on with principals in the country of Australia, you know it's a high risk profession with a lot of mental health issues associated with it, with a lot of turnover. Um, they get pressure from every direction. They get pressure from parents, they get pressure from students, they get pressure from policy, they get pressure from districts. So they're under a lot of places, but the, so this study was not done in Australia, but it's a problem that is here. This was done in the US by a, 
uh, Chang and uh, Anderman and um, Nicole Leach. And what they were looking at is uh, the principal's report of the autonomy support they get from their superintendents. So the superintendents are the people who oversee all the principals in a district. And you can see their affective commitment to their job, uh, regardless of how many years they've been in the job, is really affected by the autonomy support they feel. If they have an autonomy supported superintendent, they're more likely to have, be committed to staying in their principal's job. So, uh, you know, as I've been describing here, conditions we know are important to the support and well-being and even achievement of students. But there's a big gap between what we know in the educational science of motivation and what public policy is telling us to do. And when we look at that, there's many different factors we can look at in many countries across the world. Some countries are doing it well. I study uh, Finland a lot. I've been to Singapore. I've been to many, many countries studying motivation. So there's a lot of variation within country about policies and how they affect teachers. But they do affect teachers strongly. And a lot of policies are pretty divorced from the data I've been telling you about. And one thing is high stakes tests. Everywhere in the world where there are high stakes tests, what happens is that because they're high, and here I mean tests where not only students but schools will suffer sanctions or rewards as a function of how they do on these tests, it drives teaching and education toward a very narrow outcome and typically in a very controlling way. So it leads not only to the disengagement of students, but it leads to the disengagement of teachers because they have less support and fluidity and flexibility in how they approach the diverse students that they're facing in their own classrooms. It makes them less able to, to pick up things of relevance and interest and engage students in those things in an educational way. This lack of, uh, of freedom for teachers because of the driving force of high stakes testing is a real negative influence on best classroom practice and we should be fighting it everywhere. We also look around the world and you say, what's the most ubiquitous form of feedback in schools, it's grades. And all the evidence, there's no evidence that grades is a positive motivator, no evidence. I, I ask anybody, everywhere, every time I go for a talk, give me evidence that grading is good for students on, even when you get the A. It's not good for students. What's good for students is efficacy related feedback. Feedback that's rich and specific, that helps them scaffold, that's helpful. Grades is typically undermining of motivation to work, but yet we practice it. Why? Because it's just institutionally normative and we haven't been able to find a way to move away from it. And a, a, a third example is the fetishism of STEM courses around the world. Many governments have decided that their whole economy is somehow based on how many people are going to graduate in physics and engineering, when in fact we need all kinds of people in the world. We need those too, but we need all kinds of people in the world. Why are we so fetishizing and focused on STEM? That focus on STEM drives curriculum away from students' interest. It leads schools to drop elective courses that might be the thing that's actually engaging students in school. It has so many destructive effects. STEM is not the only successful outcome of a good education. But yet, some policies are driving it. And these are just three examples of the gap between public policy and what we know as a science of motivators about what's good for students. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just to conclude, so we can have some time for questions, uh, you know, in SDT we think people are naturally motivated to learn, to grow, to develop. That's what our human nature is all about. We are really curious animals. And so education should be supporting that curiosity and that motivation. Uh, we see intrinsic motivation and well internalized external motivation. Uh, ex um, extrinsic motivation is both important to the educational process, but both of them require support for basic psychological needs on a daily basis. Both parents and teachers, well, and as you see, administrators and policymakers are all important to shaping these influences. Um, and uh, and they, these influences will lead to both higher performance and greater wellness in students. We can't have that without more support for teachers' need satisfactions themselves, without giving them the autonomy uh, to engage their classrooms with the best of their abilities. And we need to work on policy really hard. So I thank you for this. Thank you.